Uh, this is one of my favorite graphics, so it's showing all the global trade routes in, in the world, which is really how these things get here in the first place, right? And particularly for aquatics, these are shipping routes, uh, so ballast water of large cargo ships is where most of the crap comes from, so to speak. Uh, but really, we're in this together. Whether you work on the landscape on terrestrial invasives or in the water on aquatics, uh, it's really the same issue in a different in a different place. So uh, I'd like to see more of that working together. Same team. So uh, like I said, I'm not going to go into why I think you should care, just a little bit, just in case you're new and you're like, what is this aquatic stuff? Uh, so really we're looking at massive uh, economic and environmental impacts. Uh, these are all muscle impacts that we figure would cost us over $75 million a year if we miss the boat, so to speak, and uh, mussels become established in the province. Um, that's a pretty, pretty big deal. So both uh, you know, impacts to biodiversity, the fishery, but also irrigation, water intakes, property values, uh, loss of, of recreation and tourism dollars, all calculated in that cost, which I think is conservative. Uh, so the focus really um, of, of why we need a program is both prevention and management. So obviously we don't want something like this. This is Eurasian Water Milfoil in North Idaho where I used to work in Sandpoint. Uh, imagine being a boater and going through this in September. It's completely topped out and every time that you drive through it, you're breaking up all these little fragments that will continue to start new colonies everywhere. Uh, let's prevent this from happening here. By some kind of miracle, we have not found Eurasian water milfoil in Alberta, even though it's literally all around us. BC, Idaho, Montana. Uh, later you could ask me how well we're really looking for Eurasian milfoil, but uh, still haven't found it, so that's very good. Also, as Andre mentioned, Asian carp. Like, look at the size of that Asian carp on the right. That's massive, jumping 10 feet in the air and hitting people. Funny in Illinois at the Redneck Fishing Derby, not funny in Alberta if it were to become a problem. And carp are starting to become a big concern for us. I'll tell you more why in a little bit. Also, northern snakehead, the most aggressive freshwater predator fish. I found four for sale on Kijiji last month. Not cool. They're bragging about how they're illegal in every province but Alberta. Is that true? Currently, but we're definitely working really hard um, to fix that. In fact, our bill should go through second reading today in, in the house, which is awesome news. Uh, also, Prussian carp. So again, I said carp. So this is more on the management side of things. We do have some problems already that we haven't been addressing very well. Uh, Prussian carp are essentially wild goldfish. So they look like a domestic goldfish, but they're silver. Um, they've never been reported anywhere in the wild except Alberta. So something weird is happening here. Whether it's an Eastern European population that has imported them for harvest, uh, probably, <laughs> but now we're finding them all over the province. So this is a big issue for concern. Look how many there are. Just the sheer number scares us. Also flowering rush. So as Andre also mentioned, we've had this established in the province for way too long without being able to manage it very well. It's time that we change that. Um, it sounds like we're gonna be able to move forward with the trial in the Innisfil area uh, with the herbicide. So I'd like to see some progress on this front. Mm -hmm. And addressing the vectors is also very important. So I'm gonna spend a little time talking about, this is not rocket science, we know how these things are getting here. And while terrestrial vectors may be a little bit different, uh, same team, let's, let's try to address some of this together. Uh, this is a map from Idaho showing of the 40,000 boats they inspected last year, where those boats originated from. So every single US state, every Canadian province, look at all the dots in Alberta. That means that people are passing through Idaho inspections on their way back from God knows where, probably somewhere in the Southwest US, which is really scary, um, and potentially bring in hitchhikers with them. So we don't typically see boats like this because the muscles are very well hidden, uh, but we have so many people coming back right now from Phoenix, from Nevada, from Utah, from California. These are all infested areas. It's a huge, huge concern. So you miss one boat, boom, you have a problem. This is a reservoir in Kansas, the water is drawn down, and the muscles are attached to literally every substrate. Also the aquarium and pet trade. No joke, this is uh, those four fish on the bottom were removed from a stormwater pond in Fort McMurray last year. 
40 goldfish, four different age classes, which would suggest to us that they're breeding in the wild, surviving the winter, and many of these urban stormwater ponds, the water does eventually go to a river or a lake. So even domestic goldfish could be posing a huge problem because I think people actually think that it's a humane thing to do to release a pet into the wild. We have a lot of educating to do. That is absolutely not okay. And same with terrestrials, right? That's why they have Burmese pythons in the Everglades now. People release their snakes because they got too big. Um, I'm a little radical about this, but I think if you can't care for your pet, maybe you shouldn't be able to have an exotic animal. Just a thought. Uh, and then the photo in the corner there, we're actually netting or gill netting a stormwater pond in Sherwood Park, uh, where we got a report that there were goldfish. So um, this is a big issue. I'm gonna say it's probably the second most likely source of introductions. Uh, live fish food markets. So TNT markets, Asian food stores, you can get all kinds of crazy fish species live uh, to eat. And interesting, this, um, I love this story, I'm just gonna tell it quick. We had a boater come through last season at an inspection site with a boat, didn't know anything about the issue, learned about it, was interested. Next week, he's in Calgary walking his dog and he sees this truck unloading a bunch of live fish into a TNT market, into a food store. And then he sees them dump the water from the coolers into the stormwater drain that runs into the Bow River. Is this legal? Yes. Do we, have a, do we have an alternative for them? Like, you are not to discharge the water that these creatures are in. We don't know where it came from. We don't know what fish they were. Um, this really is a problem. But I love that this guy connected the dots and was like, well, they're worried about boats, so this must be a problem, and actually called us and sent the photo. So uh, word of mouth really does work, and that face-to-face -face interaction is so important. Uh, fish farms, stocking of private ponds, or even our own provincial uh, stocking policy probably needs to be looked at because we don't want to be inadvertently transferring things from one place to another. Uh, also, after the Calgary flood, uh, I had so many people come up to me afterwards and say, my neighbor, and we all know when you say your neighbor, you actually are just covering for yourself, was uh, stocked something that looked like those Prussian carp in their private pond, and after the flood, boom, all the fish are gone. So this is definitely a, a potential source of introductions. Uh, Water-based equipment. We have water quality monitoring staff who use boats, who use nets, and all kinds of equipment. They could sample three lakes in a day. So again, that is a potential risk. Uh, fire management crews, pump trucks used in private industry, fishing equipment, the list goes on. There's never a dull moment, moment in this field, I tell you. Float planes. Uh, this question actually came up from an MLA recently. Well, how are we gonna address float planes? Well, we can, but I think it's gonna be a big education effort in the beginning. So where are these people coming from? How many are we talking about? Is it really a viable vector? Well, yes, for some things like plant fragments, like the standing water that the larval phase of the mussels could be found in, whirling disease, that kind of stuff, absolutely. And this is a pretty new one for us. So uh, other provinces are dealing with this cultural release idea. So certain spiritual groups will purchase large amounts of fish, give them to their congregation to release. We don't know what fish they are, where they bought them, or where they're releasing them. So that could be a really big issue for us. Um, and also the merit release. So again, this is thinking that it's the humane thing to do to release a caged animal, uh, which really is, there's nothing to combat that except education. And this is probably not a cultural release, but we, we had three reports of starfish in the North Saskatchewan River in 2013. Starfish, yeah. And I know it looks really healthy, so that was also pretty baffling. My only thought is that they must have caught it right after it was dumped. And so a little bit about Alberta. We are definitely late to the game. Like uh, you heard in my bio, I've been working on this issue for a long time. And when I moved here, it was kind of both terrifying and exciting because we're finally talking about it. We're developing a program. We've made great progress in two years. But it's also scary because what, what haven't we found yet? And um, is it too late? But I'm, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no, it is never too late. And we really haven't found uh, anything but the two uh, flowering rush and Prussian carp to date. Uh, Dracaena mussels, so zebra and quagga mussels, are really the poster child for the program because of the big economic and ecological impacts, but that doesn't mean that we're not focusing on plants, invertebrates, and fish. It's just a really good thing to scare people. <laughs> oh, you're scared now? Let's talk about plants. 
Um, and also the, the call to action is now because uh, zebra mussels in Lake Winnipeg, it's only two provinces away, Saskatchewan is really struggling to get a program going. We are very vulnerable. The map on the bottom shows the uh, Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans did a risk assessment of the four western provinces' vulnerability to invasive mussels. We are all high risk, high probability of invasion, uh, especially Manitoba. Weird, it already happened. Uh, and also, we have a precedent here. Government's not always great at uh, being proactive on these things because, let's face it, we're reacting to a series of problems all the time. It's hard to think ahead and see it coming. Uh, but in this case, look at the RAT program. People know about it. They're proud of it. We frame it the same way, and we can go a long ways and save a lot of money. Uh, so here's our pretty sad map of where we know zebra and quagga mussels are currently. Um, it's a really sad map, so I try to make it positive by adding a big, huge star. <laughs> uh, the star is representing the last, uh, the last drainage, river drainage, uh, that is free of mussels. And this is the Northwest, and it includes the three Western provinces and five Western states. And we really have made a huge amount of progress in how we work together with those jurisdictions. In fact, uh, this map shows a bunch of different groups. So the uh, the kind of orange colors, the smallest one, that is the Crown of the Continent ecosystem. That's really how this program began in a, in a small geographic area of the province. Uh, that's Alberta, BC, and Montana working together. There's also the, um, the Columbia River Basin, which is the brown. Uh, they've made huge strides in how we work together and standards of practice and that sort of thing. Uh, the pink outline is called the Great Northern uh, Landscape Coalition, and this is another um, ecosystem-based uh, partnership group. And then the green uh, is all Pacific Northwest Economic Region, PENWAR. And all of these groups have taken up aquatic invasive species prevention, particularly mussel prevention, as a huge priority. So we work very closely with them. And as a result, this is our risk map. So if you're a boater coming through our stations, this is how we decide if you're a high risk or a low risk. Have you been outside of the green area in, in the last 30 days? You still have to have an inspection, or soon will have to have an inspection, uh, but it would be a lower risk inspection if you are from a friendly green area. Sorry, Manitoba, no longer friendly. <laughs> I keep threatening Saskatchewan too. I'm like, you're gonna go black, you're gonna go black. So uh, there are only two full-time people working on this file, which is crazy. And so what we do is we steal and borrow people across government, outside of government, to help us do everything that, we're, that we've done. So we have five program elements. I'm gonna walk you through some of the highlights of those five elements. Um, and just know that we have cross-ministry representation as well as non-government stakeholders helping us develop the program as we go. So that's really been a huge, huge benefit. Uh, first of all, our clean, drain, dry campaign. So you'll see some swag everywhere. I'm really big on that. Uh, we're making great strides with this. We have products to hand out for people at the inspection stations when they come through that are actually useful. Like there's a chamois, clean, drain, dry your boat. It's useful, right? A beer koozie. Everybody needs one of those. Uh, waterproof wallets. Uh, these are boat launch signs that the Alberta Invasive Species Council gave us $20,000 last year to help us make these signs so we can get them out all over the province at every single boat launch so you can remind people uh, right there at the potential scene of the crime uh, what actions to take. So this is our look and feel and then we've started adding some kind of taglines, don't let them catch a ride. Uh, and this one really targeting snowbirds who are coming back to Alberta this time of year, only bring back memories. Catchy, I know. Uh, we do a lot of signage, we do a lot of outreach at events. The left-hand corner there, that is uh, Lacombe County actually did a, a check stop um, where they, they did a big education day on, for boaters. Um, that was really successful. We have uh, some filming going on. We have billboards, and I'm happy to announce this just went up uh, in Milk River, which is again targeting those snowbirds. So it's important that you maintain a look that um, that people recognize, but that you can adapt it as needed. So in this case, you know, obviously we're, we're going for the, the, the gray hairs there. <laughs> we also do a lot of advertising and articles and a whole host of different magazines and online sources. 
Uh, we've been working with Michael Short on the Let's Go Outdoors program to do uh, TV spots and radio. Um, this has been hugely successful and we'll be making another five to six uh, two minute vignettes that we can showcase on different parts of the issue. Uh, coming soon, we're going to target some of those other vectors that we talked about with a Don't Let It Loose campaign. So really targeting the pet stores, the aquarium trade, but also cultural release, anglers moving things from one place to another. It can all be captured under that campaign. Uh, a little bit about monitoring. So prior to 2013, we did no monitoring for any aquatic invasives except for what our fishery biologists might do in their own regions. Um, and I'm happy to say in 2013 we got to 55 water bodies province-wide. Uh, that's using our existing water quality monitoring staff. We do plankton tows, we also do uh, artificial substrates, it's just a PVC pipe you put in the water and look for attachment. Uh, and then in 2014 we got to 73 water, water bodies using additional partners like parks, agriculture, um, and some of our non-government uh, partners as well. So this here is interesting. We have a third, uh, not third party, but arm's length uh, monitoring agency that's just being stood up. And so it's been kind of difficult to figure out, okay, will we be able to continue what we've been doing now that they're in a completely different agency? Uh, I think so. And we're really trying to, to go towards more of a multi-taxa monitoring approach. If the program's focusing on all of these plants, invertebrates, and fish, how can we only monitor for two species? That's crazy. Uh, response is a really, I get that multi-million dollar question, what happens if? So we do have this fantastic hotline, feel free to program it into your cell phones. Uh, that is 24-7 and the operators who answer that line take all the reporter poacher uh, calls. So they can actually dispatch a fishery officer in the case of an emergency right away. And we had lots of calls uh, in the past two years and many of them do result in a fishery officer being dispatched. So it's a huge help. It doesn't just ring to my cell phone anymore. Even though they usually call anyway, yep. Uh, response plan, so we are developing a muscle specific response plan, what happens if. Uh, it sets out who, who does what, so roles and responsibilities. Uh, unfortunately, we face a huge lack of control options. This is not an Alberta specific issue, it's a, it's a Western Canada issue. We have hardly any registered products similar to the plant world um, and in really some bureaucratic nightmares to get around at the federal level, but working on it. We're even considering being the registrant for, for uh, potassium chloride for potash. Weird, I know, got to be creative here. Uh, and then addressing these other vectors as well. So this is not hypothetical. In the last two years, we're looking at 13 boats that have been fouled coming back to Alberta or passing through. Um, just some photos on the right there showing a few of the cases, the really ugly one on the top, that's my favorite. Um, and then this last one, guy called, oh, sorry, the state of Nevada actually notified us that they had just decontaminated a very fouled boat coming out of Lake Mead. And the guy called me right back. He said, yep, I'm actually not coming back till April. So I'm like, oh, false alarm. But still, I mean, this, this season is happening right now. So uh, pretty scary. We've also made great strides with our fire management folks in Forest Health. Um, now, if a air tanker or a helicopter bucket leaves the province, it has to be steam cleaned when it comes back. Uh, instead of, well, unless it's a you know it's a huge emergency and there's multiple fires and everything, I mean that would be a hard thing to do. But last year it worked really well, and I'm like, send me pictures. It's so fun. Uh, now we're working with them to, uh, they do a lot of on the ground stuff, so they'll have these portable backpacks, pumps and hoses, and so now we're going to develop a policy where uh, we ask the, the staff on the ground to flag any equipment that's used out of province in the water, and then you would make sure that it's clean properly when it comes back. Uh, watercraft inspection. So this is definitely the most visible part of our program, and we're really trying to ramp it up this year. I believe we proposed 14 inspection stations. We'll see, still waiting for those budget talks to come through. Uh, we do focus on highways, not boat launches, because we can't be at every boat launch. We can target high-risk boat traffic on the highways where you have more of a bottleneck. Uh, and this is really the model of the West. Until, uh, well, until our bill passes, again, my fingers are crossed, uh, it has been voluntary. So we really couldn't make people stop for an inspection without a legislative change. Uh, in 2014, we had four inspection stations using the commercial way scales, which is a great partnership. Uh, 3,700 boats we inspected, many of which were high risk. 
Um, two of the five we intercepted this year were at the, the uh, stations and a lot of hot washes. We are now hiring if you have an interest or children or friends of children. Uh, some fun photos, so we have great partnership with commercial vehicle enforcement, it's kind of a, a, a different partnership, they're not used to working with environment on many things, but they've been so amazing. We have transport officers who are now appointed as fishery officers at the scales who can help us hold a boat, issue a decontamination order, and they actually have taken a lead in decontaminating the boat, so that's awesome. This is the goal for every boat that comes through the station. So while you hear a lot about mussels, we're also looking for plants, debris, standing water that could harbor a whole host of other things. And this year we introduced a pilot with uh, mussel sniffer dogs. So there's a 10 day pilot shared with Montana. Uh, we had two dogs that were trained at Lake Havasu and we got a lot of attention on this. This is pretty much entirely funded by the irrigation industry. So that's been a really great partnership as well. These dogs are focused. I love this photo. So you have cameras, you have a lake right there, you have uh, you know, people eating and smoking and they're still just like so focused. And I had never had heard about it a lot, but never really seen it in action. And we had two live quagga mussels on the boat, could not see them with the naked eye, and the dog found them in less than two minutes and could show you where on the boat they were. We also have to be very clear about what we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds like uh, the dogs will be coming back, and in this time instead, well, we're doing a contract with the same organization out of Montana, but to help us develop the program internally for the long term, so we don't have an expensive contract every year. Uh, legislation. Uh, so first, this is the current state of. So surveys and Surveys Act and the Public Lands Act essentially lay out that yes, if it's under the ordinary high water mark, we are the responsible agency. Great, good to know. We also have the Alberta Weed Control Act, where as you know, we have many of the aquatic or riparian plants listed. Um, I think we all know there's some issues with that, but it's really great that they're listed somewhere because where else would they be listed? Uh, I'll answer that again in a minute. And we also have our Provincial Fisheries Act. So just so you know, there's a Provincial Fisheries Act, there is a Federal Fisheries Act. Uh, currently, we had two species listed as prohibited. So all those species that we've been talking about, only two, zebra mussels and lamprey, were actually prohibited to possess. That's crazy. That gave us the shortest list on the planet. Uh, Got to do something about that. Ministerial order is also in place, which essentially said it's a short-term band-aid solution that said zebra and quagga mussels are bad, and let's make sure fishery officers can help take action when we have a high-risk situation. Uh, and like I said, we just got transport officers at the weigh scales appointed as fishery officers specifically for this purpose, which is really a great show of support. So, right now, second reading, probably three o'clock today, listen to the radio. Uh, here's what we're trying to do. Create our own prohibited species list that will be easier to modify in the future. Um, there are 52 species on that list and it includes aquatic plants, invertebrates, and fish. Uh, no more of this two species business. We gotta, we gotta catch up to the rest of the world. Uh, our list is based on high priority species uh, that we definitely need to prevent, uh, and this would make them prohibited to possess, which includes sale, import, and transportation. Of course, some people are going to have Kabamba in their aquarium, and they would not be a criminal for having that until January 1st, 2016, uh, when you would need to either dispose of it properly, uh, hand it over for us to dispose of properly or uh, obtain a license for having it. Do we really want to give people licenses to have invasive species? I didn't say that, you didn't hear it. Uh, mussels and plants were saying dead or alive. Why? Because this time of year, say a boat's coming back from Phoenix, uh, it's fouled with mussels, three days in our brutal climate, well it's been kind of nice lately, but uh, under freezing temperatures, they would actually die. But the problem is, you need to remove them because if, a, if a, the boat launches in the spring and the mussels fall off, we find them at Gull Lake and we assume that we have an infestation. We undertake this expensive, uh, heavy, labor-intensive effort to respond and it was totally unnecessary. So dead or alive is very important to us. Also, it can be difficult to determine if they're dead or alive when they're attached to a boat. And then the meat of the amendment is really the mandatory stopping. So uh, if this bill passes, it means that if you are a boater, uh, you have any kind of watercraft and you are driving by a station that is open, you have to stop. 
You don't have to go out of your way if you're not on that road and you didn't pass it, but you do have to stop if you are. Um, we're using the definition of highways as defined by the Traffic Safety Act, which includes literally everything. It's uh, public or private, anything a person could pass over or park on. Done, check. Uh, enhanced authority to deal with other vectors. So let's address the aquarium and the, and the pet industry, the horticulture industry that may be selling some of these prohibited species uh, and make sure that we have the ability to quarantine an area if we do find uh, an infestation. Okay, so federally, um, they're just about to make, uh, it's about to go into law that it would be, it would be prohibited to import uh, quagga and zebra mussels in four species of Asian carp, including the jumpers, uh, and also grass carp that aren't triploid. <laughs> and uh, this could really help us at the U.S. border. I mean, think of it, everybody has to stop at the border. Right now, they don't help us at all. They don't tell us they're coming. They don't track the number of boats. They don't say nicely, please proceed to the provincial boat inspection station. It's right there, you can see it. Uh, so that would be really nice to get some help from them. We're not sure what it will be. It may be just that friendly gesture. It may be uh, they'll ask their own questions or do their own inspection, but I kind of doubt it because they have over 500 pieces of legislation to enforce. Um, they're also delegating our minister as a delegated authority in the case that we found something and needed to control it. So right now we have to get federal approval uh, to do pretty much anything. So again, could not do this without our partners. Uh, the council is a major player in that. I'd like to see uh, their role even expand, if they're willing, uh, to help us with, you know, whether it's research on control options, biocontrol, or education efforts. Uh, I think it's a great partnership. And some other stories I want to tell you about. So we've been getting, there's so, such great support for this program that we've received money, can never say no to money, uh, from the boat launch signs, but also uh, billboards. We have um, summer villages paying for promotional materials that we can hand out at our inspection stations. Uh, we have a tiny summer village at Sylvan Lake wanting to buy a washing unit for us. We have uh, the Sniffer Dog Project, which is pretty much entirely funded by external partners. Uh, we also have an immense amount of in-kind uh, support as well. And then we have the uh, Water Council Project, we have those three acronyms, uh, Summer Village Association, the Urban Municipalities, and the Rural Municipalities Associations all passed formal resolutions in the past year urging the province to take further action on the prevention of aquatic invasives, which I believe is largely uh, responsible for the legislation moving as quickly as it has. So thank you. And with that, I love this photo. This is uh, in Minnesota. They've started incorporating this into any new launches that are built, where they actually have a, a specific area where the boats would pull over and, and make sure their boats are clean, drained, and dry.